from deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Potscast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorable children and planning the revolution. I was getting into this song. This is a good article, all right? So I was kind of like sucked in. And actually, I haven't seen this. You haven't? No, this hasn't come across my feed. You're, which you need, I, I feel you need like, more cool people in your feed. No, I've got to get the liberals out of my feed. Oh. I think I need to start pissing them off so they leave. Yeah. I, it's, That's I don't what know, I'm trying I, to do. I'm a little too nice, I think, in some ways, where like liberals are happy to be on my page. It's, it's it's a little disconcerting. I'd like them to go. The absolute, the straight up fascist ones always leave on their own. Yeah. So this arc from me actually thinking of myself uh, as a liberal mm-hmm. to me with all these open, angry critiques of liberals yeah. has been a long time coming. Yeah. And well, uh, hey, you know, and, and I think most people still haven't. Ma- made that distinction oh, yeah, like yeah. what do you mean there's something different what do you mean left is different than the liberal l- liberal how well there's left and right <laughs> and there's liberal and conservative yeah you may have noticed they're not the same words <laughs> so it for for a while it, it seemed like those things were converged the, the left, left and liberal yeah i well but they haven't been, and, they, haven't and been. they weren't for a lot of people. And I think it's convenient um, to elites to collapse them. It was. I think that was the the real project of the DLC and Clintonism. Well, no, and, and also, like, there's a certain like, you know, as people like came to um, think warmly of themselves as right wing conservatives, like it was a compliment, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. like for a certain group of people to describe themselves as right wing conservatives. Yeah. Um, that wasn't an accident. That phrase that people, I, right. I noticed around, I don't know, 2002, three, something like that. Uh, ish, yeah. People started actually calling themselves that. They said, right. I'm a right-wing conservative, as right. opposed to some other kind of conservative or something. Um, it, it, it's rare, I think, historically. Yeah. As long as there's been like a right and a left wing, yeah. that people would fondly describe themselves as right wing. Right. right. Like in a, t- t- typically, people who were right wing were trying to deflect that fact. Yes. Or actually, members of the elites were trying to like claim you know, otherwise. Claim otherwise or hide. I mean, like I still have like this sort of like like uh, this, this shame. Like I don't want to mm-hmm, mm-hmm. admit my background amongst. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, people were crypto right, you know, right? the same way they were crypto fascist. Right, so they, they would be crypto right, and they wouldn't. Yeah. They would never admit in public that they actually supported the right wing. Yeah, that didn't make any sense. Why? No, who, with the who rise, would su- support the right wing. Somehow, right? after the rise of Fox News, it became a badge of honor. I mean, like some kind of a badge of honor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. that was the word I was looking for. And um, so, I think it's not an accident that um liberal and left and conservative and right became married in our mm-hmm. you know collective subconscious mm-hmm. and, and understanding that's not that wasn't uh like oops yeah. look at that it just kind of yeah. happened you know no that that was i think that was intentional yeah so that you could actually then advocate right-wing policies and people were like hey maybe that's a good idea because mm-hmm. you know i'm a right-wing conservative mm-hmm. yeah as if that's like something to be proud of, yeah. You know, but you know, I, but people are, and you know, I don't, I don't mean to like trash talk right. them personally, but you know, people because are. well, they don't, they don't really know or understand I what right meant. What right meant, yeah. And then there are some people. Th- this is actually a fairly small group, I find, mm-hmm. but they exist. I, I think they're statistically significant. Mm-hmm. Um, who are like, yeah, I understand what it means, and I'm there, and I'm there, I'm there for it. I'm there for it, and they're kind of like, but w- do we really want to hurt like you know the elites? Would that be right? Is that cruel to hurt them? Yeah, and, and they're kind of like, but you know, if I don't stand up for the elites, who will? You know, right, 
Right. No, they and really like, do. They're there for into yeah. a lot. I mean, it was like the Mencius mold bug thing. The the modern royalists. There really was yeah. a, a a group of people, and it's hard to un- believe that they're not actually just trolling. It, but, it is hard to believe, now, but I, some of them don't seem to be. They don't seem to be trolling. I think they're genuine. Yeah, and, and they believe in this hierarchy. In the same way that a lot of religious people, I have to say, believe in hierarchy. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and um, well, I like as in I believe in hierarchy because like it's real, mm-hmm. like it's a real thing. Well, no, I right. mean as in they that it should be here and they should support it, and it's given. By, oh, yeah, yeah. But it's whatever. given by God. It's it's yeah, uh, yeah. That know. that's kind of twisted. But yeah. no, there's this um, and I, I cynically have this idea that the folks who are like. I understand what the right wing is, and yes, I'm there for it. Have this kind of maybe one day I'll be an elite. Oh, well, sure. You, you know, yeah. <laughs> like you know, the, uh, the temporarily embarrassed mar- millionaire yeah, thing, yeah. right? I think that's so, a, a I think real it's thing. There. That's it's probably a real thing. that's probably how to get people to sympathize with. Right. Them. I think that's the mechanism, but I don't yeah. know that people are really like yeah. holding that image in their head. And then the if you uh, consider deeply Fox's role as propaganda for for the the elite right for the elite for yeah. the right um then their sort of relentless campaign to push uh wealth and virtue as the same thing mm-hmm. uh helps that make sense right? right because you know if if uh the the ideology was kind of like well if you're really virtuous you'll become wealthy therefore the people who are wealthy must have been really virtuous right and are virtuous yeah, it seems it seems legit, right? <laughs> it's it's about as legit as the prosperity gospel. <laughs> That's not a thing, by the way. Just you know. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we're uh, we're really late tonight. Oh my god, it's so late! It's we're after gonna, eleven. We're gonna try and be short, and we're gonna try and do a brief show. We were really gnawing our knuckles, like, can we do a show? Do we have time? To do a show because you know I've got work in the morning and all that. All that. I have children to take to the doctor. Yeah. I have so many forms to fill out. <laughs> I, I, you know, I sometimes I'm like, oh, I should just. When's your f- appointment? The children have the uh, so Veronica, Sam, and Eleanor have an appointment tomorrow afternoon. It's afternoon. Yeah, so all I right. could probably get their forms filled out. Okay. And probably fill a tank with gas if I was. Okay. Yeah. Fortunate. Um, so just to, real quickly, it's getting hot again. Yeah. And it's supposed to be in the 90s tomorrow and Tuesday. Um, what did I do? <laughs> it feels personal. It really does feel like a cruel joke at this point. We had a few days, uh, oh, were scant days, like two days, two days that were quite gorgeous. nice. Yeah. Just but gorgeous. no, it's going to be even too warm to sleep Tuesday and, or Monday mm-hmm. and Tuesday. It's going to be terrible. Um, what else is going on? Um, we had a great taco bar last night. Oh yeah, we had uh, we had some friends over, and you did like a big group cooking thing. Yeah, it was fun. Which was really cool, but we wound up making way too much food, as we had is so much a food. danger for that sort of thing. Yeah, you know, I don't, it seems unfair. Like you know, like seriously, we couldn't eat all this. <laughs> like seriously, we had what a dozen, more than a dozen people here. Yeah, and we couldn't finish a watermelon. That's pathetic. Yeah, I, somehow. And I just, I'm not that hungry in the summer, right? I'm too. not burning calories to stay warm. Yeah. That was that was actually something that happened when we were living in our old house and I would spend my work days in the office upstairs where it was like in the 40s or 50s, you know, yeah. with, even with the heat on. It'd be ravenous. Right, is that I could eat a huge amount because I was keep... burning a lot of calories yeah. to stay warm. Making and warmth. not succeeding. <laughs> But so we're going to try and be quick and um, I'm going to introduce this article. I pulled out a single article and we skimmed it and we're going to read go for it. bits of it and talk about it and then try to be done in time for me to edit this and get in bed by what, one thirty. I don't know. Let's go for it <laughs> as best we can. Anyway, this is a, an article from The Intercept. Mm-hmm. And Which is like... You know, if you want anything remotely rational, even the Intercept is like deeply biased and has all kinds of issues. I'm not going to mm-hmm. 
like unpack all that here. But like you can find generally something rational. You can find interesting pieces. Right. Uh, and the author is Brianna Gray. Yes. She has a name spelled B R I A H N A. Anyway, just in case you're looking her up, mm-hmm. it's a little unusual spelling, I think. Right. Um, so I will put that in the show notes. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like what, which of these uh, platforms now off, are offering jobs, or are able to provide employment and, you know, and a uh, platform to oh, people right. who are actually on the left. Right. And, well, this, like and how article? left, yeah, well, no, I mean, in, in the world. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like you're talking about the inter- the intercept, you find interesting pieces, but they're often not quite what you would hope. Right. There's not like there. <laughs> it's not pe- out there. People don't see. If you want to be right wing, if you want to mm-hmm. grow up to be right wing, um, or, or like come out of school and be a right wing, there's a vast. Uh, Best treasure trove. Right? Treasure trove of resources. There are jobs waiting for you. There are think tanks. There are plenty of Koch brothers funded this and that. And, yep. you know, Fortune might have have you as an intern or the Wall Street Journal or, you know. All that stuff. There, there's a lot. And you know what's And really they have money. They have, yeah, and we live in this world where if you want to eat, you have to have money. Right. So right. it's like the, the the deck is stacked. Like suddenly right. being right winger seems like a good idea. Yeah. You know? But if you are genuinely left coming yeah. out of school and whatnot, first of all, you probably didn't get a very even or deep or coherent, coherent introduction to leftist thought in an American college, despite this tro- oh. trope that... um. You know, all the colleges are hotbeds of, of leftist, you know, of, of Marxism or whatnot. They're hotbeds of liberalism. They're yeah. hotbeds of liberalism, but that's not like... That's not the same. Not very many professors are really teaching deep Marxist principles and other leftist thinkers. No. And so I think people have to kind of do like a a lot of catch up on their own and c- yeah. catch as catch can you know right and you find the one you know leftist professor on campus yeah who's, you know, yeah smoking weed and wearing a turtleneck you know? <laughs> and do they still wear turtlenecks uh, no, i don't know and okay. the uh and leftist professors are more frequently targeted and purged and attacked and censored yeah um yeah. despite the right-wing belief that it's like you know, if only conservatives had some kind of a voice in the, uh, you know, in the world, that's a it. voice in the media and a place in on campus. Well, that's the thing, because that's what conflating it allows you to do. Mm-hmm. There is this problem where conservatives don't have much of a voice anywhere. Yeah. Right? Well, real conservatives. Right. Right-wingers have right. a voice everywhere They've all the time. They've got their own network. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they've got a couple. Well, they've got a couple. Right? <laughs> and and liberals are you know, all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Just everywhere you look, tripping off the walls. So you know. But uh, yeah, if you if you want a schooling in actual leftist thought, I mean, the people that I admire and all and who do their podcasts and publish their articles and books and whatnot came to where they are usually by dark, murky paths. Yes. Like they had, which you wouldn't necessarily want to send everyone on. Right. Like they had very strange life experiences like they wound up in central america or they wound up in cuba or they wound up in you know uh interviewing people on the street in belarus or you know for some out there thing happening right and eventually came to some kind of leftist ideology that they can share yeah that yeah but it's not necessarily very well fleshed out Right, and often people have big gaps in their education. Mm-hmm. I do, you know. Oh, right, yeah, of course. So, I mean, unless we're going to do, you know, uh, did I mention that starting next week we're going to do our eighteen-part uh, deep dive into uh, Das Kapital, Book One? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't talked about that yet. Okay. Yeah. Well. Uh, and uh, each show will be four hours long, and you'll have to f- take notes. Have to take notes. Uh, yeah. It's a little difficult, especially since we'll be reading it in the original German. So you know, <laughs> buckle up. Is it German or Russian? German. Okay. 
anyway, I, I'm joking. Yeah. Anyway, let's. I, I, I just started out saying, show. talking about how um, how we were going to make this a really short show, but what always happens? This is our date night, right? Right. We finally so, get a date. We finally get a little time to ourselves, away from the kids, and, and we start and, laughing and talking and, and having a good time. I don't want to. Um, we don't want to wind it up quickly, right. but we need to wind it up qu- quickly, or I'm not going to get this done. So, so beware the race reductionist. Yes, you want to read? Um, I I can read. Um, I, I'm going to jump right to what I think is the heart of the matter. For okay. This. Yeah, it's um, it's quite a long article. It's a long, even like and yeah. We tried to highlight the interesting bits, but realized right. we were highlighting like old pages. <laughs> Like, oh, this whole page here. Oh, my goodness, all this. Because really, it's been edited down. There's not a lot of extraneous, you know. No, no, it's it's pretty meaty. It fits well into her argument. I have very limited criticism. Yeah. Um, Because really, the heart of it is is this, okay? Okay. So, um, uh, the first, like, the, the, like, of... Uh, revelatory realization or like expression of this idea where you would be a race reductionist and say oh you know we can't do this or that because is that gonna solve racism you know mm-hmm. just asking mm-hmm. um that was actually um uh hillary clinton in 2016 who like brought put this on the table as a thing do you want to read that bit yeah i'm going there so she says that the, during the uh, 2016 presidential campaign well, if we broke up the big banks tomorrow, would that end racism? Would that end sexism? Would that end discrimination against the LGBT community? Would that people make people feel more welcoming to immigrants overnight? I'm going to answer that in a second, but not just now. <laughs> it, but, it, it's so to me, it's so horrifying that anyone would consider that to be an argument. Like that's right, your argument? Right. Are you? Is that really what but you're no, saying? They, so well, they really I'll come did. back to that. That yeah. so, but. She put that out there, and people were like, yeah. yeah that makes sense. Uh, and our leave. author here's commentary, it was a daring and adroit deception. Yep. Ignore this structural salve that would upset the status quo, she implied, because it won't resolve that more personal, more visceral issue, which goes straight at the heart of your identity. And so here I'll talk just briefly about my one criticism of this mm-hmm. entire article. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's something I mention all the time. Uh, she conflates bigotry and racist, uh, racism as the same thing, mm-hmm. like the author of the article does. Like she describes structural uh, racism, racism yeah. and calls it bigotry, and they're not the same thing. Uh, you know, they're just not the same thing. And then, and, and frankly, personally, I don't think we need to like do anything about personal bigotry. I think structural racism deserves our full attention. Mm-hmm. Um, and similarly, she also uh, t- uh, conflates uh, liberalism. No, no, she doesn't conflate liberalism and left, but progressivism and leftism. Oh, yeah. She kind of equates those. Yeah, that's, that's another one of those words that we should right. try and unpack and get. And they're not, out. they're not the same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, leftism was first. It's not actually, and actually it's, it's kind of intention and at odds with progressivism, which also isn't liberalism. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, that's a, that's a I'm a little touchy about conflating those words. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's actually my only criticism of the article as a whole. I would recommend it highly. But mm-hmm. this is the really big piece. And okay. then uh, further on, she says it's almost as if the real agenda here isn't ending racism, but deterring well-meaning liberals from policies that would upset the Democratic Party's financial base. <gasps> really? What the, do you think they would do that? That's awful. Do you think they would do that? <sighs> But I'm going to answer Secretary Clinton's question. Um, so she asked, if we broke up the big banks tomorrow, would that end racism, sexism, discrimination against the, the queer community and make people feel more welcoming to immigrants? Actually, it would, you know, because racism... It, it would do. It would be a death blow. It would go a long way. No. It, it would go a long Breaking way. of the big banks would be a, a death blow. It wouldn't actually be the thing... That like you know wouldn't die that day, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but it would be the beginning of the end to actually really just level the big banks. The author points right? out that in the two thousand eight financial crash, 
people of color lost 40% of their assets. Oh, because you see, that's ra- institutional racism. That's structural racism at work. Mm-hmm. That's what's happening there. So, you know, actually not bailing them out would have been a thing that would have attacked institutional <laughs> would have harmed, structural racism. It would have been racist not to bail them out. Uh, Apparently, or some in some demented universe, yeah, right. Yeah. And that's actually, not, that's not the ar- argument the author the author's no, making. the author's not making she's, that argument. She's pointing no, out. She's this. pointing out the the uh, absurdity of that argument. Yeah, um, yeah, it would go a long way to end sexism. It would mm-hmm. go a long way to end discrimination against the queer community who frequently can't find housing mm-hmm. unless they're you know really wealthy. Yeah. Um, and actually, you know what? A lot of the, the sort of like anti-immigrant energy that you see being stoked up and inflamed is in people who are afraid for their personal security which is at risk because of the big banks so you know we could actually deal death blows to many of these things to actually address that one problem Mm -hmm. so yeah that's horseshit it's along well okay well no the the, just this this argument at all right like you know if we if we had medicare for all would that actually stop doctors from discriminating against black people? I don't think so. I'm just saying, you know, that's this is horseshit. And it's a, I mean, it's a rearranging. Uh, people are constantly taking programs that are universal, right. and reprioritizing and saying, "Well, if our real priority is is helping people based on their identities, then then universal programs themselves are actually counterproductive." Are bad. Well, right. now, and there's there's two pieces to this, but right? But there's, there's a kernel of truth exactly. in there. Exactly. That's the reason right. it works. Right. There's a kernel of truth in there. Yeah. Um, the first time I actually, so I we were talking about Hillary Clinton, clearly Hillary Clinton putting this on the table. Mm-hmm. The first time I witnessed this test pilot, it was actually, I think, 90, 94-ish, mm-hmm. five. Um, it is actually the Republicans responding to the the first Clinton administration talking about health care reform and universal health care at that time. We've been having this conversation a long time, just so you know, folks. Yeah, um, yeah. And they actually said, well, you know, there aren't any universal health care programs in Europe that cover mammograms. This is sexist. <laughs> and of course, the lie yeah. is none of them cover it because actually they've done the science and it's not a good screening tool it's a good diagnostic tool. Yeah. It's just a lousy screening tool, so they don't pay for it because it doesn't not, actually save lives. It's not been determined to be the best practice. Right. Yeah. So, but we persist in this here mm-hmm. because we don't want to be sexist and, you know, save the tatas. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, and the other thing, you know, just people, those who admonish these broad economic policies on the grounds that they won't end bigotry rarely, if ever, propose alternatives that will, nor do they suggest reforms that make flawed universal programs more perfect. This fact, more than anything, exposes the bad faith of at least some of the race reductionists. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was it was just something you wanted to put in here? Because I, I had a couple other things, but yeah. Why don't you do your couple other things, and then I want to back up a little bit and talk about some of these arguments in the wild, as they're oh, currently sure, seen sure. in the wild, so people can maybe be better prepared to recognize them sure um she talks uh, she talks a little bit more about um some great historical unpacking of like the what we call the march on washington which was actually the march for jobs and freedom originally originally right? titled that yeah. and talks about addressing poverty at source and i started this as i was reading because they talk about poverty the source of it being a paucity of well-paying jobs for low-skilled workers yeah. and i'm thinking to myself well actually the source is like the capitalist system itself right, right. and the distribution of wealth and then she, a little later she goes on and talks about how King was assassinated after he began talking about the legitimacy right. of the capitalist system. Right. And it's, it's right. you know, liberals love to quote some of King's more famous speeches. Oh, I know. Isn't he great? But they really don't talk about his radical <laughs> yeah, no. labor activism and he anti-capitalist he and, anti, and anti-war and anti-imperialism. Don't they don't talk about that. We can't talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing they don't like to talk about is how Malcolm X like evolved towards nonviolence, like hmm. towards the end, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> they don't like to talk yeah. about because they like to discredit X, right? And in uh, bolster King, yeah. And so yeah, they can't talk about Malcolm X's embrace of nonviolence towards the end, right? Which is actually what got him killed. Yep. 
And when he started talking about Pan-Africanism and nonviolence, and what got King killed was talking about the legitimacy of the system. Mm -hmm. So those, Mm -hmm. the things that got them killed are the things that liberals can't talk about. Right. Very interesting. Still. Like it's, you know, yeah, and it's a it's a little like later. you talk about Nelson Mandela, or <laughs> Not, the revered dude, nonviolent violent activist. activist right? Like, wait, what? Yeah. You mean that terrorist? <laughs> um, and, and it's called a freedom fighter. It's called a freedom fighter. It's bravery. Um, but the left's critique, she goes on uh, talking about the left's critique of identity politics, is not really a critique of identity politics at all. But my favorite. Yep. We frame it is that's the cynical weaponization of identity mm-hmm. for political clans. And when it's just like this this little bauble, you know? This is why I thought this article would fit relatively neatly into what we've been talking about, including our um the show where we talked about mistaken identity. Right. And this is basically it's 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 not just a defense against attacks uh from the right, where, you know, yeah, there there are attacks on the right about equality, right? But um it's actually preparation for going to war against leftist candidates yes. to discredit them, yep. right? And, and that's actually what it's like—the framework to discredit yep. leftist candidates. It was it was Hillary attempting to discredit Sanders, and now it's already it's being ramped up and spread around in preparation of of, of attacking. It's like a disease, honestly. Um, anyone who's actually got leftist ideology and and right platforms in 2020 um and then my last bit here so there's there's this concern that broad-based material policies universal policies Mm -hmm. will replicate and reinforce or worsen patterns of discrimination and that's not unfounded it um is what happened yes it's what we've done it's what we've done every time we've engaged universal policies. Right. They've actually been used to reinforce right. structural racism. Right. We've talked about the family wage and we've talked about the New Deal yeah. and how that All those was structured originally to leave black people out. Entirely. Yeah. And, and some of it was actually very sort of like um, um, with plausible deniability. Like, right. you know, we're not going to include railroad workers because... You they know, have their own pensions. They system. have their own pensions. They yeah. do their own thing. We yeah. don't want to like take that away from them. It has something to do with being paid by taxpayer dollars. Therefore, you know, they could, that would be double dipping or some something. kind of bullshit sophistry. Right. The actual thing was they wanted to make sure that black people wouldn't be covered by social security. Right. That was the goal. Yep. And then there are other things that were much more explicit in the exclusion of black people, yep. and much more explicit in the exclusion of wi- exclusion of women, exclusion of various identity groups. Yeah. And it became, uh, and this is how uh, eventually, after the um, the sort of more inclusive programs of the, um, the great society, right, uh, w- left themselves wide open to to attack, right. And, uh, especially by right. Reagan and his right. and attack leader. is built in; it's baked in, right? Because you can attack it on racial terms. Yep, and they they become more they became more inclusive, and therefore it immediately led. Well, not, not, you know, it took years to build up this uh, this rhetoric and this and oh, this yeah. framing, but it, it was started to be. Years. Yeah, it started to become all about the welfare queens and how yeah. those undeserving people are getting handouts. From your from your tax paycheck, dollars. your tax dollars. Yeah, taking money out of your children's no, I, mouth. I was listening. To, uh, sorry, not listening. I was reading uh, someone on Twitter talking about how she worked uh, in a ceramics studio as an intern after graduating, mm-hmm. and uh, they were trying desperately to earn a little money. Right. Um, and she she had this internship going and was not getting paid because they hadn't sold any pieces and this place oh, right. was barely surviving, barely right, held right. together. And she wound up uh, in poverty and mm-hmm. eligible for food stamps. So she took a... Well, that was a live conversation. That wasn't Twitter. That was real. What? That wasn't Twitter. That was real. That was a live conversation. I was there. Yeah, go on. <laughs> oh, that's right. Well, right. you tell the rest then. Oh, gosh. No, do I have to? It was good. You, you don't have to. I'm going to tell because I'm not sure what the, the punchline you were going for because there were like two or three punchlines in that. Well, so um, the woman who was really broke and really out of food right. and her housemate mm-hmm. um, bought with food benefits. Yeah, you're right. You know what? I confuse the things that, that happen. So, right, yeah. Um, with food benefits, bought like 
white flour, wheat flour, beans and rice, beans, apples, rice, apples, potatoes, apples, potatoes. Right. All these real, um, like ingredients. Yeah, all these ingredients, all these things that required labor to turn into food. food. Right. I mean, except for apples, but you know. But like, you know, that were basic staples. They weren't, right. there was nothing in there that would be considered a luxury good. It was a grocery cart full of, you know, Wholesome, things that, basic you foods. know, basic, just about as cheap and low budget as you could, could get. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And what was the one thing they threw oh, in? Oh, like, so her roommate liked to uh, mix up brownie batter oh, and yeah. eat it out of a cup because, you know. So, like, the one luxury, fun. ridiculous right. luxury that they allowed themselves in this kind of dire and um, depressing really? circumstances. Right. Where the, I guess her roommate would fill up a bathtub, put in, you know, some bubble bath and sit in the tub and eat up. Like a, a cup of brownie batter, brownie batter without even baking it into brownies. Right, right. So, in this shopping cart full of staples, it was a box of brownie mix. Was one box of brownie mix, and predictably, Some as ass- they were checking out, <laughs> an asshole this arrived. On food, <laughs> a hero arrived. <laughs> che- checking out, a hero arrived, and and began to lecture and scold this broke woman on Food how stamps. she was wasting you know, taxpayer, she, dollar. taxpayer dollars on the shame on and luxuries. name her publicly <laughs> could you eat brownie mix yeah how dare you yeah this kind of thing happens constantly now and the like, people yeah. that do it are liberals oh yeah not conservatives, conservatives no. no a lot of times conservatives are like I don't know um I don't know, maybe they have foster kids. I don't know. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Right, they've got some kind of like little narrative in their head. Who or knows? I don't know. Um, but yeah, a lot of times folks that do this are liberals. It's kind of embarrassing. And I'm like, I don't know, should she have that baby? I mean, she's homeless. Mm. Like, yeah, well, there's that too. Yeah. But, uh, but this on wasn't on. even that. This no, it wasn't was just even that. like, you know. Just like yeah. having a box of brownies. But no, so this is, mark my words. Yeah. So this this thing, this fact about the New Deal. Yes. Democrats are going to use identity politics yes. as their reason to dismantle the rest of the New Deal. Yeah, as, and, The Republicans and, won't do it. The Democrats will. Yeah. And the reason they will do it is because of this identity politics. Because of identity politics. Yeah. The yeah. Weaponized, weaponized identity. Right, right. So th- that that will be their, their monkey wrench that they throw yeah. in to yeah. fully dismantle. Now, mind you, I have to say, I've never been a fan of the New Deal. Right. And I've always felt that it was just um, a band-aid to stop revolution and to stop radicalization. Right. Um, but a universal programs would be a much better band-aid. Like if, yeah, but you know what, they'd be a better band-aid? And she talks about how, yes, there are problems with these universal, universal programs. programs. Right. They will, in fact, be applied inequitably unless... Almost by definition. Unless, yeah. Unless we actually carefully structure them not to be. Not, right. You have to... You have to yeah. But that's not a good enough reason... To not have them. To deny everyone. Well, and I think this is, this is the philosophical underpinning of what she's talking about. Mm-hmm. Because in order to structure this program, in order to make universal health care, mm-hmm. you have to make a governing philosophical decision about what you're doing. Yes. Are you promoting families or are right. you freeing people from families? Right, right. Are you promoting individualism? Right. Are, are you, you know, are you trying to put the reins on individualism? What are you doing with what's, this program? What's the real what's governing ideology behind how you administer the, the program? Exactly. So, yes. Yeah, and that's a big... That's a very big question. Yeah, yeah. And it's fraught. Right. And I agree. And, and that's this is, true. This is what... And the fact that they, you know, chose, made certain... Choices around this historically are what leave these programs open to the criticism. To the now. criticism they have now, right? So we've yet to have that conversation as a right. society. Like, right. what are we about? Yeah. I mean, we're not having that conversation. It's just kind of unfolding based on people's market desires yeah. and what I want to on advertise on and on what advertisers tell us we want. Yes. Yeah. That's how it's unfolding. We're not actually having a conversation or saying anything about who we are yeah. and what we believe. And I think there can't be a thing that the United States is. 
unpacking but a single a monolithic a single, thing. A single yeah. thing. I don't think that exists. And unpacking that, like what these programs mean mm-hmm. based on, you know, their history and right. and how they've been administered. That's there's that's the textbook we read part of, right? And right. didn't didn't even begin didn't to begin finish. To finish. Yeah. Right? So we've got books piling, piling up. up. Yeah. Waiting to bury us. No, no. Yeah. So yeah, and I, this is my other prediction. Um Democrats will not pass universal health care unless they in other words, they're going to use abortion as the wedge. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, it seems you know, like a safe bet. Right. That that'll be their wedge, and that's why they can't do universal health care because it's sexist. Right. Because this is basically, if you think about this in Totus, yeah. This is basically like the last um, sort of like bit of trappings to convert the Democrats into the Republicans we've always known. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's that really appears to be their goal. Here. And they're embracing that. They're embracing I, it. A fully. lot of my friends. So, so the uh, the DNC, the Democratic Party, just voted to restrict the right of super delegates. Yeah, whatever. So that they would only have a, a tie breaking vote in, in a second vote. That is, yeah. if if there was a second vote having to, to the, yeah, that was deadlocked. Taken, and right. I've got friends who are Democrats who think this is. A horrible thing that they're letting the leftists win because they they are a little they've made themselves a little less hierarchical like what's their rationale and a little less you know but what's their rationale they are royalists they are conservative republicans and they just that's right it? they yeah, okay. believe in the elites they believe in the elites. status quo that's their rationale and well, the leftists you know. are are it's always negative terms for people bringing up stuff like but universal the dirt bags. you know they're they're dirt bags they're agitators they're they're disgusting they're destroying unity they're dangerous they're you know they're responsible for trump anyway oh yeah please i want to cite a couple bits from oh, this yeah. article Go ahead. because Go ahead. Uh, she, to do research, it's kind of funny that you would do research this way, but I think it's legitimate in this case. <laughs> she right. asked her followers on Twitter, hey, give me examples of of this kind of thing happening in the wild. Right. And she got a lot. Oh, yeah. And here, are, and I've, I'm aware of some of them because I followed, you know, some a, a bunch of leftists on Twitter. Right. Uh, but here are some of the the I, here are some of the cases where this sort of ideology crops up in the wild. Here, right? Sally Albright, a Democratic Party communications consultant, she's a real piece of work, I have to say. Yeah, argues often that free college is racist because mostly white people go to college, and it reinforces the status quo. If it was free. <laughs> Yeah, and the author of this article talks about how people of color have to borrow more for college. Oh, it's harder for them to achieve a and, degree, but they enter college and they push for enter, entering college, college at a higher rate. rate than other groups, right? Actually, yes. but but it's harder for them to finish to because finish. the economic burden is higher because of their income level, you know, than their well, assets oh. and their family support and all that stuff. They yeah. wind up with more debt than white people. They wind but, up dropping out and the due re- to financial. And reasons. let's be very clear: the reason that it's a higher financial burden. Is because of a legacy of structural, structural racism. racism. Sure, yeah. it's, so in other words, it's not like their family doesn't support them. It's right. their family that got them there in the first place. Right. So let's. Uh, you know, so the, making yeah. college. So, but literally to say this is breathtaking. It's to really say, breathtaking. Making college free would be racist because, because helps, all of our programs help mostly white people because the United States is mostly it's white. It's mostly white people. So. No, it's really a, a... There should be no policies that yeah. help people? Is that her rationale? Well, you know, Senior Democrats and <laughs> Republicans, that is their rationale. We shouldn't help people because, you know, it's racist. Senior legal analyst at Rewire News and popular Twitter personality Imana Gandhi suggested to her 124,000 followers that caring about Wall Street is evidence of white privilege. In other words, yeah. wanting to break up the banks. Yeah. 
writing, I would love to wake up in the morning and have my first thought be, I hate Wall Street. That's the whitest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how? let's just take one simple... How stupid does she think black people are? Yeah. Let's just take one simple example, one simple thing. Mm -hmm. um, overdraft. Overdraft fees. Yeah. That's not a black issue, right? That's not an issue for black, black people? people. Like really? How? Really? Ha Actually, like having your account black Twitter, drained black Twitter by overdraft fees when when you With make a mistake and, and you're $5 right, short right. and suddenly you're Boom. $300 and short and your account's frozen. And you're 300 bucks in the hole. And you half your next paycheck is gone. Yeah. Right? And no, no, Black Twitter is lit up with hilarious texts about overdraft fees and how much the banks suck. Yeah. So black people actually literally wake up yeah. and think how much their bank sucks. And, you know, I'm fortunate. I am. It is. Here's my whitest thing you've ever heard. I haven't paid overdraft fees in several years. Right. Yeah. Because I've been fortunate and you know privileged enough mm -hmm. to not actually crash my checking account right but in the past i've certainly done it many times well, well yeah well actually i always say that automatic automatic withdrawals were my best friend i could never pay bills on yeah, time until that yeah, happened sure <laughs> like when that came yeah. along in the 90s man I mean, changed everything for me yeah and i'm part of it for me is that um in, in my current job which is now i've had over three years mm -hmm. um I get paid weekly, right? Which really helps with that, mm -hmm. right? Because you, if you screw up your budget, if you have a big unplanned expense in week three of a monthly cycle, right? You know, you can get screwed. You can really, really screwed, <laughs> right? Well, no, I think we were talking about this before, and it's either weekly or like quarterly. Yeah, so right. So you either get a huge lump sum, sure, periodically, or you get it a bit every week. Yeah, if I got a, if you got a huge lump sum, you could actually earn a little interest on your. See exactly, income, yeah. Right? Not a, not, not a lot because nobody pays any interest anymore. Anyway, yeah. in a similar vein, Dara McKesson, popular podcaster, charter school advocate, and Black Lives Matter icon, retweeted a tweet which read, Wall Street didn't nominate a secretary of education that believed guns and Bibles have more place in schools than LGBT and disabled students. Actually, they did. Yeah. God damn it. Actually, they did. Yes, yes. That's implying, just a lie. As she says, implying that because Wall Street isn't to blame for, well, anti-LGBT policies, the financial industry doesn't merit critique from black and or LGBT Americans at all. That, right. But. Yeah. It's an example of weaponized identity politics. And every time, every word they utter is just a goddamn lie. Yeah. When someone pointed out that New York Times columnist Charles Blow shouldn't be uncomfortable with a 50-plus percent tax rate for rich because taxes were even higher in the New Deal era, Blow tweeted back, You can feel free to return to the 30s. Wasn't so great for my folks. In other words, he was basically saying, Well, you know, if we had high tax rates like that, we'd also have Jim Crow again, right? Obviously. Right. So th that doesn't necessarily follow. No, not really. So, Actually, and so, we can also talk about the economic health of black communities in that time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. When they got to let's talk about what happened to them when they got to economically healthy. For example, yeah. yeah. An anonymous but popular Twitter personality disparaged a job guarantee program because black people had one hundred percent employment for two hundred and fifty years, and that didn't help racism. <laughs> You're just staring straight ahead, <laughs> incredulous. <laughs> so, so giving every black person, guaranteeing every black person a job wouldn't do anything. I mean, yeah, and and conserve like where I can see right wing commentators saying, "We're just making them slaves again. They're going to be on the Democratic plantation." You yeah, know? because. They are Republicans. I've been saying it for years. And everyone's like, how could you say such a thing? Yeah. Because yeah. it's true. It's true. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I remember when this article came out, um, in a Vice article, Monica Potts claims to support single-payer health care, but she cautions against Sanders' plan on the basis that it would destroy jobs worked by low-income women. In other words, all the women who work in the insurance industry denying claims, 
right? All those jobs are at risk if we. Oh, <laughs> well, that's why we can't we can't abolish ICE. We'll get rid of all those jobs, right? You know, we can't yeah. abolish the TSA. What what are those people going to do for a living now? Yeah. Although that's, she yeah, did moderate it a little bit by saying, you know what, it's true. If we had like a strong social safety net, wouldn't matter. They can maybe find you know new work or at least get you know support. Or work because you know yeah. they want to work. I'm just saying. Yeah, and th- this yeah. was a very recent one. Uh, Terrell Germain Star, a journalist at the Root, um, wrote a an article on um, Sanders' bill about right. cash bail. Okay. And the title was Bernie Sanders takes on unjust cash bail system, but still doesn't make direct connection to institutional racism. (laughs) But this is the roots general take on Sanders is that he's awful because he's not a bunch of fucking neoliberals. He's not. Yeah, they are. A lot of them. He's not enough. He's not obsessed completely with identity politics. Right, yeah. And therefore, nothing he does is is worth Worth considering. Yeah, no. You see that a lot. Yeah. I I, want to like the root. I mean, I I post their stories, right? Yeah. But I also post from the New York Times, so I'm not not saying much. Um, Yeah, no, just a bunch of neoliberals. I I really, I can't. I, I wish, yeah, I just can't. Sorry. I'm going to come back to Albright again because she uh, is. I, you know, uh, what's funny to me though yeah. is I've often said that employment is slavery and people won't like, you know, get on that uh, board. But like yeah, this, but unironically. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Go well, ahead. Albright again. Oh, Albright again because she's one of the the people's. She's, that, a, really, she's a pioneer in this. Uh, yeah. In this field. No, it's really. Distilled, distilled the essence of this dominant strain of criticism when she tweeted, Sorry, kids, no way around it. If you say a policy helps all Americans equally, that policy is racist. Structural racism must be addressed. You know, and it's like she's twisting my words. Yeah, actively like twisting actively as twisting they're, they're coming words. out of your mouth. I like, yeah. and like, but everything, what? everything she does is like that. Like, how did you do that? That's... It, it's yeah, it's this jujitsu. It's verbal ju- jujitsu. It's like a, it's like a gift and a curse. And her, and what she comes up with is so crazy that it's not even wrong. So you can't. <laughs> so it really puts people on their back foot while they're like trying to think through how to like, even explain what? why this is, you know, how broken it is. How broken that is wrong, uh, yeah. s- across the board, right? Yes. Uh, let's see. Yeah. There, there was one or two more here. Uh, ending capitalism, this was someone quoting someone on Twitter. Yeah. Ending capitalism will displace people of color. Money is what keeps us in the game. But yeah. if we end capitalism. Yeah, that's not, it's completely ignorant of the goals of socialists. Or, or like the goal yeah. of ending capitalism. Right. I mean, it's kind of like those people like, you know, money isn't real. Right. Well, how are you going to pay for that? But money's not real. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very funny, cute, cute. How are you gonna pay for those stuff? <laughs> it's not real, though. Yeah, and Albright tweeted that income inequality is only a priority for cis white men. Yeah, uh, ask actually impoverished people of color, LGBT people. Uh, ask them if income inequality is 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 a, an issue for them. A priority, if or just how about if their income is a priority for them? <laughs> but, but cis white men don't have a problem with income inequality. <laughs> yes, we do. I do, but um, I get all right. I guess you're cis yeah. white male. But it's, I mean, I don't have that. You know, honestly, it's true. I don't have that much of a personal problem. Right, with it. right. <laughs> like it's not a personal problem yeah. for cis white men. It, right. Yeah. It, it kind of just isn't. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna read one more bit, and then I think maybe we can just say we're done with uh, with this piece. I think so. Yeah. All yeah. right. So, intersectionality, the buzzword taken up so faithfully by mainstream Democrats in 2016, requires an acknowledgement that, like race and sexual identity, class is a dimension that mediates one's perspective. That means the hashtag Trust Black Women shouldn't collapse the interests of Oprah, a billionaire, with well. Anyone else's like she's yeah yeah. Similarly, not all blacks or Latinos should be presumed to speak equally to the interests of poor and working class people of color. 
This is a truth easily internalized when Democrats consider figures like Ben Carson or Ted Cruz. Right. Right. It's more difficult reality to swallow when considering one of our own. So they can see it then. They're well, like, they look at Carson and they're like, wow, so even though he's a black man, he doesn't seem to be working in the interests of people of color. But I want you to notice that they have no effectual... They have no effective critique of Ted Cruz or Ben Carson or, or any of these folks mm -hmm. because they can't criticize their own. Mm -hmm. So if they could make the same criticisms of, say, Obama's policies and how they harm poor black people, yeah. then they'd be on solid ground to criticize right. Ben Carson. Right, right. But they can't make those criticisms of Ben Carson Because since he has the identity, he's checked the box. He's checked the box. And there's nothing else to so say. So there's nothing else to say. There's no criticism to well, make. Well, okay. But some do still have a sense of unease with someone like Carson. And they're all leftists. Yeah. Yeah. All the liberals are like, well, you know. You shouldn't say anything mean about him. him. Shouldn't say anything mean about him. And Ted Cruz, uh, a Hispanic, right? Technically. You know. <laughs> Who's clearly working in the best interests of uh, our uh, right. immigrants and, and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which again, uh, then actually, this is I do want to mention this. Um, so the idea that like immigration is a Hispanic issue right, right. is a little perverse because like right. one in ten Hispanics are undocumented. Yeah. So it's like this kind of assumption that all Hispanics are undocumented and therefore right. this is their issue. Right. When actually, as Americans, peculiarly. Immigration is a universal issue for Americans because of the nature of America. Yeah, yeah. Right? But if, I mean, but yeah, like like many things, if you pick apart people by their identities, then you can right. weaponize that. And you can weaponize uh, yeah. that, right. right. And so turning it into an Hispanic issue yeah. allows us to collapse how immigration literally, effect, literally affects every one of us and how we police yes. immigration right. literally affects every single american right and then and then you wind up with liberals um happily uh you know co-signing like arpeos you know traffic stops traffic ran, stops random stuff traffic stops to Just check your check your, your papers please laws right right they're there for it yeah so you know because you know it's racist <laughs> it'd be racist not to it'd be racist not to yeah so yeah uh, is that I, I had like two. Please go two, ahead. What is it? Oh, did, can I remember what the other two things were? So one of them was I did. I wanted to. Um, we're done um, with the article. Yeah, we're done with the article. <laughs> we're done there. And and one thing, oh, maybe it was even three like short things. One thing I know a lot of people are remembering a famous senator tonight, and uh, you know the last couple of days, and I and I want to remember a famous senator that actually hasn't died, um, but I've always admired. And uh, which is hard for me to say. I there's a senator you've always admired. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I uh, well, he was senator, and then he was governor, and um, I worked on his uh, Senate campaign. I worked on his gubernatorial campaign. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I've always admired him. I actually I don't admire politicians in general. In general, it's a bad, you know it, it's kind of a dangerous thing to do. Don't admire them. It's I don't think helpful. well of them. Um, and to some extent, like that sort of uh, weaponized persona that they have that mm -hmm, you see, mm -hmm. which is, I don't even consider that a person. That's a product. Yeah. Right. Well, so sure. I, right. It's well, I like, said, right. Like a, like a speech when you see a president give a speech. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, the it's days marketing. Of a, the days of a president actually writing a speech. My that's God. That's yes. the long gone. <laughs> So what you, whatever you're listening to, that's marketing. Yeah, it's like yeah. a brochure from a car salesman. Yeah. Don't whole you know. team of people worked on right. that for days. So uh, yeah, I, I don't even respect that as a person. Right? Mm -hmm. um, there's certainly a human being involved, and in, I respect a human being and their dignity. But yeah, not not even a person. Yeah, all of Reagan's famous speeches were were written. Yeah, yeah. Photo, yeah. not photoshopped, but like uh, workshopped. Yeah, and and well. Yeah, and well. Let's be very clear about that. Um, but this this uh, man. Uh, attempted to remain a human being hmm. and so uh, did not retain his in his seat and did not actually end up not running for governor again. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking about uh, former Senator, former Governor Lowell P. Weicker from Connecticut. He um, was a Republican mm -hmm. and then ran as an independent for governor and is still somewhat active today, was very vocal. Um, How old is he now? I think he's 81. 
so you know and i and i expect that he will not get a lot of fanfare when he passes he's not yeah. famous anymore yeah right and and really part of the reason is he insisted on remaining a human or tried to remain a human being mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. rather than becoming a product hmm. and um which is the source of my respect and admiration for him mm-hmm. um and and you know his his legislative record is available to anyone. He's fairly liberal, um, not as conservative as I would like embrace personally, mm-hmm. but I always respected his um, culturally liberal. Right, he was culturally yeah. liberal, and I always respected his commitment to his constituency. Um, one thing he was famous for to me uh-huh. was fighting against um, price fixing amongst oh, grocery yeah. stores. Yeah, and how you know there was. It was really terrible. There was open collusion. Going open collusion, on. where where people did not have access to grocery stores, or, or like they could only go to one grocery store because they they didn't have transportation. Mm-hmm. The prices would be three times higher than they were in the suburbs, yeah. where it's people part, could it's drive part of around. The, f- the food desert. Thing. Right, yeah. right, and this is sort of like even predating the food desert thing when he was, I think, uh, before he went to the federal level government. Uh huh. Um, and in the Senate, he famously remarked. When pushed back against Reagan, he was one of the only Republicans who pushed back against Reagan's welfare queen rhetoric and said, you know, we're talking about one percent. Yeah. One tenth of one percent of the entire budget. We're not found to be fraudulent. That we're not like even like the whole piece of the USA funding for food stamps. Sure. This is like half of one percent, one tenth of some minuscule part of the budget. We're not balancing anything by having this conversation. Right. No, we could that's, double that's, that's it. That's a good point. We could double the budget yeah. for this. But it's also true that when they do dig in and actually investigate for fraud, it's There's the same. No fraud. It's the same kind of thing. It's like let's let's drug test. Let's drug test recip- those people. You know, everyone. They're like. They well, can't afford drugs, you know. Of, yeah, and the rate of drug use it turns out is lower than the general population. Oh, Fancy that. So. Um, so they find one person to make an example of. You know? Right. And they, you know, parade this poor person around. So um, as Senator, he pushed back against that. Um, he eventually was abandoned by his party and lost to um, Senator Joe Lieberman <laughs> in a really vicious campaign. <laughs> and here's the comedy, right? Uh, uh, the comedy of the campaign, uh, the, the attacks, right? So mm-hmm. on the one hand, mm-hmm. Weicker was married three times. I believe yeah. he's still married to his third wife. Okay. And like his first wife, and I'm sure he was sleeping around and had all these issues, yeah. right? And like, so his first wife left him, and his second wife left him because he was always in Washington. Mm-hmm. They, they saw him once a month. It was a hard something. life. Yeah. Right. And then for his third marriage, he started spending more time in Connecticut, right? So Joe Lieberman's ad had two attack campaigns. Uh, attack campaign one was that he was like this sleeping, hibernating bear hiding in Connecticut and only coming to D.C. to vote. <laughs> and the other attack was he's been divorced three times. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe Lieberman, of course, two was times. Di- well, he's been divorced twice, right? Yeah. And he's been married three times. That's what, yeah. yeah. And Joe Lieberman, of course, is divorced and remarried. But yeah. that yeah. was, you know, sure. so this was the attack, right? right. He ends up losing. He cast about for a while, and he didn't run for governor as an independent, and famously instituted our income tax, which was supposed to go away mm-hmm. once we balanced the budget. <laughs> that was written into the law. Yeah. Yeah. But we liked the money, so we kept the income ca- tax. And, and they've kept the budget on balance. Yeah, they kept the budget on balance, right. right. Liked the money, pocketed the money, right. and like, you know, kicked, you know, got rid of him. And actually, he refused to run again after yeah. like one term. It was like, this was hell. You told me about right. how he was cursed and spat on. Literally for, spat on in for, public. Right. Not for anything having to do with the Vietnam War, but for... <laughs> no, no, but... Because he was trying to end a, uh, an ongoing, endless pork barrel road project. Yes, yes. Yeah. There's like a... You've heard of the big dig in Boston? We yeah, had yeah. like a stretch of 91 in Connecticut. It was under construction for like 26 years. Mm-hmm. Not, like, I wish I was kidding. Yeah. It was just every no, year... I'm not... You know, I, I believe you. I mean, it's there, yeah. this kind of thing happens it's all absolutely over. absolutely absurd. Yeah. So, you know, he's like, okay, it's time to end this. And people are like ready, like physically... Charging him, spitting on him. Yeah, it was You're just taking, awful. Taking bread from my children's mouths. Mm, how could we're you? We're second. We've been. We're now third generation Richard, workers on this road what? project, or something. <laughs> Some just deep absurdities yeah. like that, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, one other thing 
that I thought was very interesting. So he, uh, his first child and second marriage was born with trisomy 21 in 1978. Hmm. Yeah. So he's 40 years old this year. And I remember there's a, an article about profiling him as senator. Uh -huh. Because he was a senator then, and his family and their adjustment to this. And you read, so in 1978, the doctors actually came in and said, you know, you could just leave him here and we'll take care of it. Oof. Right? Yeah. And, you know, and they were like, like well, there was, the, there was a state system. Right. There was a state system. They were right. like, you know, just, you could just pretend this whole thing never happened. Institutionalization. Just yeah. pretend this never happened. Yeah. Just go home. No, my mom was part own. of that whole deinstitutionalization movement in her right. work and career and all that. But there, there was a state state hospital system, right. and uh, which is just sort of very. It sounds yeah. absurd to us yeah. now, but you know, that was not long ago. You you wouldn't want to inconvenience yourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you could just pretend this didn't happen. Um, and so you you read this People article. That's that's actually the backstory of Rain Man, by the way, the the movie. Right? Yes, that part that that like people don't think of it as such a dark story, but it kind of is. It's a very dark story, yeah. actually. Anyway. And that the moral is that he really needs to, he he belongs in the institution. The moral <laughs> of the story, right? <laughs> well, go figure. One you know irresponsible young uh, guy Sibling. with no life experience can't. Uh, it isn't actually good at taking care of an adult with with special needs, right? right. <laughs> Shocking. No support and no training and no experience at it, right? But there it is. Yeah. Imagine that. Right. Um, so you know, you read this article in People, in it's published in 1980. Yeah. And and you hear his wife talking, and she's talking about like the struggles that they had. And how, you know, she really seriously considered leaving him there mm. and how hard it was to raise him and yeah. how, you know, she still open to, was still open to maybe institutionalizing him if he didn't develop well. I don't know if uh, he had any heart issues. but uh, I, They didn't specify that. Yeah, they didn't but, talk about that. But that's so common with T20, with Down syndrome. Right. You know? And um, at the time, I mean, the the survival rate for heart Oh, but it was, related it was very to that low. kind of thing was quite low. Well, yeah. it was very low. It was hard. It was challenging to do the surgery. If they didn't all, even know how to do some of those surgeries. So, right. so a lot of a lot of children died just because they just couldn't figure they could out do. anything to to do to fix their hearts. And there was a window in the early eight, late seventies, early into the eighties, where they wouldn't do the surgery because yeah. the child was developmentally disabled. Right. So what kind would, of a life are you really giving the yeah, child? Uh, yeah. It's just longer. It just won't longer. be better. Yeah. <laughs> And so, yeah. Yeah, so there was that yeah. as part of it as well. Um, but then you read you read what he has to say, and he sounds like a 2018 advocate for people with disabilities. Interesting. It's really remarkable. He was ahead of his time. Yeah, yeah. it was prescient. When uh, he talks about, he says, you know, people have this idea of Down syndrome children as like this fat kid sitting yeah. in a corner with his tongue hanging out. Yeah. Well, I'm telling you, if you put a kid in the corner and feed and him, him there. All, leave him there, he's going to get fat. <laughs> feed him starch and nothing right. else. Yeah. <laughs> and he won't know how to do anything. Right. But if you take him out and play with him and treat him like a person. Yeah. That's actually, oddly enough, that's true of all kids. <laughs> look at that. So it's this really, like, seriously? He was saying this in 1980. Mm -hmm. People were still talking talking about how it was best to hide the fact that this has ever happened. Hmm. Yeah. And so he was a strong and early advocate for the Special Olympics, and especially in Connecticut. And the one good thing the Kennedys ever did. Oh yeah, you know. Right. If yeah, one good thing, and um, and uh, and actually was uh, one of the main champions of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Mm. And he was actually not in office when it was finally adopted. Yeah. Um, but he did a lot of all that legwork. So, um. And perennially, like he would say, you know, do the right thing. He would just do the right thing. And for many years, it won him well, re-election. That's not very practical these days. No, it is not. But it cost him re-election to the Senate. It yeah. cost him um, the governorship. Yeah. You know, I mean, on one hand, he chose not to run. On the other hand, how could he? Yeah. Um, and really, a long-term career in politics. Didn't cost him his life. Didn't cost him his comfort mm -hmm. or any of mm -hmm. those things. Um, but a lot of people get really addicted to the political career yep. and they make decisions they wouldn't otherwise make. Yeah, um, I think that's true. I yeah, think that's true. And so, um, I've always respected and admired him for 
not doing that and just you know going back home to his yeah. regular life yeah and continuing on even though you know doing the right thing meant he wasn't viable politically and um interestingly there's always someone who wants to look him up and ask him so what do you think about you know hmm. 45 what do you think about this because he always has people thought asked him what he thought about the Iraq war and he was opposed to it etc go figure go figure yeah. right yeah um, no we don't we don't uh we like to sort of um treat our failures as uh you know as learning or as val- yeah, yeah, yeah no. we, we don't go back to them and try and figure out what they know that we didn't and we didn't know yeah exactly. people who have left a job i mean how many how many companies actually do exit interviews right yeah <laughs> people who, take have, them who have left a system or opted out of the system usually the attitude towards them is oh they were never a real whatever right they weren't a team player they weren't really they didn't have skin in the game they weren't this they weren't that whatever not oh maybe they have a perspective that's valuable and do something that we we didn't aren't know listening to right yeah and you see because it's treated in that very much uh, that oh, way the mockery my Just god the open you know vicious mockery yeah and um yeah you see a little bit of that with weicker but not not so much yeah um uh, he was, he's someone you could really respect as a person. Yeah. And um, I'll miss him when he's gone. I've always, I always thought of him as the Maverick. Oh. Always. Yeah. 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 That's why I respect him so much. Yeah. I was happy. And, you know, today, 30 years later, I'd work on his campaign again. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So that's what have, I have to say. Uh, you have some articles or links you want to uh, include in the show notes um, for him? Or? Maybe I'll, I'll see if I can dig up that People article. Dig up the People article yeah. if it's online. Otherwise, and, um, um, or yeah. so, something I could put in the show notes. Oh, for. and this is this is news to you, too. Um, okay. I uh, was invited to speak at FPR again, actually, about the, a retrospective on the black community of the last over the last 50 years. Really? Yeah, so that's oh. going to be fun. Oh, yeah. good. We want to we want to preview your, your talk, yeah, too. Yeah, I'll do a talk for that, yeah. That okay be, so i think that's that i think that's it are we wrapped up i think we're wrapped up yeah because it's gonna be a long night <laughs> gotta get this i'm finished. sorry i had a lot to say no i i i appreciate it that's those great comments about Riker and um great I, i'm Riker, glad we Riker. Did, what not commander Riker. lowell p Riker with a w oh really yes w-e-i-k-e-r <laughs> all these years i've been saying Riker. All I've all these years I've thought you were saying Riker. Oh my lord! I'm sorry. I have a thick accent. I'm sorry. Well, when you're tired or when you're angry, yeah. you sound like a Kennedy. <laughs> sorry, it really comes out. You're like I'm from Maine. You're like you're not from Maine. I'm Southern New England. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Okay. But sometimes you sound like you're from Maine. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I will endeavor to spell his name correctly in the show notes. Please I hope send so. me a, a link or something. Yeah, I hope so. All right. <laughs> I, I, I'm i glad we didn't... Uh, I, I was trying to avoid just reading the entire article, which is, I think, like our yes. default. But and I think we did. Not necessarily a bad thing. Some people might appreciate that, but it's a little... Well, with some of the books, I think that's really valuable. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But you guys can read the article. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad we could get a show done, even though we're tired and maybe we're not feeling it quite as hard as we uh, we like to. <laughs> but yeah, you know. Anyway, do. thanks for joining us on our date. You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Potscast. Check out the show blog at potscast.blogspot.com, where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Potscast on Facebook or YouTube. Goodbye. Bye. Wiker, really? Wiker. <laughs> <laughs>